Hey folks, I'm Janusz. My wife just messaged me that uh, I'm in high stress level, so uh, that's a good start. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a software engineer at Airbnb. I work on developer platform, uh, and today I'll be talking to you about uh, some lessons uh, we learned in our JVM monorepo. So to kick things off, how many, things, how many folks here use JVM languages at work? OK, I see quite a few hands. Uh, for folks who didn't raise their hand, I guess you're in the wrong room. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm going to try my best to uh, bring you along, and some of these things are language independent. Um, so like I mentioned, I work on developer platform. What is developer platform? Uh, developer platform at Airbnb is a group of people that wants to enable engineers to uh, produce the best software of their career. So we are organized in an agnostic developer infrastructure and specific verticals uh, that own the end-to-end -end developer journey of a given customer cohort. Uh, each of these has a monorepo. We migrated most of them except Android to Bazel. Um, you can see um, this is a QR code for the iOS uh, blog post on the migration. We also have an upcoming one for uh, web platform next week. We also have Sharmila here who will be talking at 12.10, uh, I think. Uh, so come tune to that. But uh, in this talk, we'll be talking about service platform, which is our uh, backend and uh, Spark data, uh, data pipelines um, uh, monorepo. So, uh, I want to give you a bit of an idea of, of scale. In the title, I said large. We have uh, over 30 million lines of code uh, spread uh, across three languages. Scala is predominantly used for data pipelines, uh, though we do have some services written in it, uh, but we no longer allow new ones. Uh, Kotlin is quickly gaining ground as a backend uh, development language, but predominantly we're still Java. Um, in terms of RPCs, we use Drift and GraphQL. Uh, we have microservices architecture as well as a lot of individual pipelines. Uh, that together makes up well over 1,000 deployable artifacts. Uh, we have over 1,000 uh, folks uh, contributing to this repository, and we also use a lot of third-party libraries. Uh, not everything is uh, great about our repo. Probably the biggest complication is just amount of different types of versions we have. We have uh, 8,000 versions of third-party libraries. We have four versions of Scala, three versions of Java. And the last one is uh, we use Lombok, uh, which gets in the way of more things that you would think, as I will get into this talk. Uh, for folks unfamiliar with Lombok, Lombok is an annotation processor that adds missing features to Java, but does it in a way that's uh, using unsupported compiler internals. Um, so now uh, I'm going to the main section of the talk, JVM postcards. Basically, each postcard is a lesson that roughly fix, fits on a single slide, just like a postcard where you have a finite amount of space. So I'm trying to go broad instead of deep. So let's jump in. Uh, so JVM languages produce bytecode, which is platform independent, but Bazel cannot take advantage of that out of the box. Uh, this is because the JDK differs by platform. And as Bazel calculates the transitive hash, it will produce cache misses. So you can see here we have Java C, binary from Linux and Mac OS, and they do actually have different hashes. So Bazel is doing the right thing, technically. Uh, but this is really unfortunate, because that means you cannot consume cache results produced yet by your Linux CI on your MacBook, or inhibits things like dynamic execution or mixed execution on, on, on ARM at x86, either for testing or cost savings or whatnot. Uh, so initially, to bypass this, we were running local builds fully remotely, but that eventually became a bottleneck. Um, there are some um, new features, like scrubbing, but they don't work with RBE. Uh, so we decided to use universal binaries, as it's something you can fully implement client-side without forking Bazel. Uh, universal binaries are just like uh, uh, fat binaries that package binaries for all the platforms and put a simple wrapper script that dispatches to the right one based on the platform. Uh, the biggest drawback here is the size. We have, support to, we have to support four platforms, so the size becomes 4x. Uh, however, we didn't find it to be an issue in practice. Like JDK is, let's say, 200 megabytes times 4, it's 800 megabytes. But a lot of it is actually platform independent, so you can even uh, lower that down. There's a really um, a good doc uh, from Tiago on how Bazel is thinking on that, like a bunch of uh, different ways of doing that. I think there was one of the options there was universal platforms. I don't know quite what happened to this, but uh, that's basically what sort of we are doing internally. 
Uh, so to be more concrete, uh, because I think this one is really important, um, so uh, how do you actually do that? So you actually have to overwrite two toolchains. One is the runtime toolchain, one is the bootstrap runtime toolchain. Uh, to do that, you have to define a new Java runtime, um, and you have to put a few things. So in light blue here, it's like just the Java runtimes of all the four platforms. These are the things that the wrapper will refer into. Then in the orange are the wrappers. These are like the binaries you care about. So this is like JAR, Java, Java C, JDEPs, whatnot. These are the wrappers that like actually refer to those JDKs. And then you have to put some random stuff, because if you don't put something dummy there, uh, the build will just explode. But it, it doesn't matter what you put there. Um, so there is also some patches you have to do to rules Java. Uh, so uh, first and foremost, you have to replace uh, IJAR and single JAR tools with universal binaries. There is a bit of a gotcha here, because all of them have pre-built binaries except Linux ARM. I don't know exactly why that is. I can only guess that uh, the GitHub uh, Bazel CI didn't have ARM machines. And I think recently that changed, so maybe that's why. Um, you basically have to create that uh, yourself. It's pretty easy for the single jar and iJar. You can just run these Bazel build commands, and then you uh, create an archive and uh, consume it in your build. Uh, and there's one last thing which is um, the output paths will be still a problem because they incorporate the name inside. Um, so historically, we've been fixing that by setting the host CPU and CPU flags. There's a newer flag now, experimental platform output there, uh, which um, um, as long as you define a new platform, we'll, we'll do that for you. It's, it's just nicer. Uh, but if you do all of this, then you can run, you know, however you want across any, any architecture and platform. And like, that's like the JVM superpower, and it's like makes sense to use it. Um, OK, so usually you use, use JVM languages because you think you don't need C++. Uh, and so if you don't have any C++ code in your code base, why do you see C++ compilation in Bazel logs? And uh, there is a good chance that the pro problem comes from the Proto C compiler which wants to uh, compile from source. And it's quite easy to actually get it as a transitive dependency, even if, like us, you are using Thrift and not uh, gRPC. Uh, one uh, example is that any uh, worker, Bazel worker implementation will probably need that. Uh, this has been unknowing for many reasons, but uh, the previous mentioned cross-platform builds would also have the problem here. Uh, there is a solution now. You can bring your own proto tool chain with this incompatible enable proto tool chain resolution flag. Um, you can also use Bazel SQL with emphasis on C uh, to find where this uh, proto C is uh, sneaking into your build. Um, there's resources online, so I won't go into this. And again, like you want to use a universal binary. Um, one bummer is so not all rules, open source rules, uh, rule sets still uh, uh, use this flag. The, in our case for JVM, gRPC Java and gRPC Kotlin still haven't uh, onboarded last time I checked. Um, so next we go to RB. So this is the big feature that lured us into Bazel. Uh, we use RB a lot, uh, but uh, I think the most critical thing is that you really have to figure out something with remote persistent workers. So um, remote builds are two times slower without them for us, or even more than two times. So JVM has a warm-up problem, which causes slow startup. This is very visible when um, having small packages, as a big percentage of compilation time is, is, is spent there. Uh, Bazel solves this problem locally with persistent workers, which keep a warm process. But originally, there were no equivalent for RB. Uh, there is one now. You can set experimental remote mark tool inputs which uh, will, um, will set this persistent worker key on the execution property with the value of the transition half hash of the, of the tool you're using, uh, allowing the remote to properly invalidate workers. So if you really want to do RBE with, 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 with JVM, this is like really critical. Um, so uh, there's another problem of like invalidation of these workers, right? If you put all the actions into the same place, if uh, I was running this, now I have this persistent worker, but let's say some task action comes, kicks it out. Uh, if I have to constantly restart them, that doesn't really help. So what we do uh, is we use pools. Uh, so we have dedicated pools for Java and Kotlin, uh, and we route all the uh, actions uh, in there with a pool execution property. Now, the trick here, the tricky part here is also 
just because you set an execution property on a target doesn't mean you're doing the right thing, because a tar target can be composed of multiple actions. And probably only one of those actions is the, is the persistent action, like the action you want to persist, the compilation action. So you have to be careful. You can still get some invalidations. Um, there is another form of invalidation where sometimes, rarely, this persistent worker key actually changes because you actually change something. And uh, you can be thrashing with, with, with different actions. So what we do, we actually spin another pool called the upgraded pools and basically flip between them when, when, when that happens. It's, it's operationally taxing, but we keep our builds fast this way. Um, while at it, we, you know, we have default pool, we have test pool, we have different test pool sizes. Uh, it can support x86 and ARM. Um, we also have two flavors of these pools. So um, for, for, we call them high priority pools. They're basically used for interactive builds, so human builds, like builds that humans wait and like use fingers to, to, to start. Um, they have a bit of a different cost to queuing trade-off, so we want to ensure that there's no queuing there. Um, I wanted to give like a quick example, like what you can throw at RBE. So um, one of the challenges of monorepos is their evolution. And one of the tools that we employ to aid here is Open Rewrite, which is an automated code refactoring tool. But uh, as we were moving to Bazel, we couldn't find the working open source way of using the tool with Bazel, so we wrote our own. Uh, it's actually very simple. The core logic is several dozen lines of code long and calls into the tool's API directly. I thought it might be useful to just give something for reference here. This is a simplified version. This only works on Java. We also support Kotlin. And, um, we also have some additional optimizations. Uh, we don't scan the class path to create the environment, but passing a YAML descriptor to the relevant recipes and parsing, converting AST, and reserializing can be separated into multiple actions to also benefit from the caching. So um, initially, we run this as a standalone script, one target at a time. It would obviously take forever. Uh, so then we wrapped it in a Bazel action and uh, use Axpect to avoid target pollution. And uh, with RBE, we get it to down to 15 minutes. And it's really not too much work. You, you can throw very large things at it. Um, so next one is uh, determinism check. So, but like a JVM edition. Um, so first of all, if you don't have one in your repo, you probably should. Uh, it helps tremendously with, uh, with cache hits. Uh, the premise is simple. Uh, run uh, two builds uh, with cache disabled on different hosts and uh, compare their execution logs for differences. You can even run them on different architectures because we claim that we can do that. Uh, so let's go through some concrete examples. So uh, I think this is everyone's favorites, timestamps in jars. Uh, so jars are zip archives, and these contain timestamp of all the elements. Uh, it's a common error to have these leak and cause builds to be non-deterministic. Uh, a simple solution is usage of single jar with normalized flag. We saw the single jar before. Um, we saw this a bunch in our internal rules, even though we know that this is a problem for years uh, in, in, in Gradle, in Bazel, everywhere. Uh, but for example, public version of this, I believe rules antler still suffers from this currently. Um, next one, we have uh, absolute puffs. Uh, this is similar to timestamps. They can make things not reproducible machine to machine. Uh, public example of this that I think is still not fixed uh, is in rules Scotland. So outputs for JDEPs files from uh, KTJVM library targets will include an absolute path to the Kotlin standard lib. Um, this means the cache entries will, will include these outputs and cannot be shared. Um, this only happens for the standard library, so internally we skip that from output and massage it in IntelliJ loading. Uh, so we don't sit on any pretty fix for this, just for, for, the, for the context. Um, Scala can trigger the checker, but it's not really a problem. Uh, we, ignore, uh, we ignore the sdeps files, which are kind of like jdeps, and uh, we set this attribute to disable diagnostics. Um, there's obviously many more issues, like, I don't know, non-deterministic non uh, code generators, but these are some uh, specific JVM flavors. Again, if you don't have it, set it up. Okay, so this one might be a bit controversial. Uh, so we believe that uh, Bazel usage should be probably minimized in in inner loop of development. Um, for those that haven't heard about this concept, concept before, uh, the inner loop refers to the local cycle of writing, building, testing, debugging uh, that developers go through frequently uh, every day while working on code changes. 
Uh, this differs from the outer loop, which occurs less frequently, often spanning days or weeks, and includes uh, all the CI, CD processes that happen after a pool is requested. And these two loops are connected by pulling and pushing from, uh, from and to a central repository. So uh, Bazel is great with monorepo like ours, but we always hear people complain that things are much slower than in smaller multi-repo. Uh, we are talking about single digit or even sub-second uh, test execution times. And we believe that Bazel is not positioned well to solve for this, both because the overhead and as well as lack of incrementality within actions. Um, so what we do is similar in concept to fast builds um, from Bazel IntelliJ plugin. However, we delegate to IntelliJ's incremental compiler instead and maintain our own fork of the Bazel plugin. Uh, we've done the same thing before for Gradle, uh, before moving to Bazel and saw great results too. Uh, there are negatives, obviously, to this approach in that things can drift, but we believe the trade-off is, is more, than, more than worth it. Um, we still require users to sync uh, to keep uh, Bazel and IntelliJ models in, in, in sync. Uh, for example, when a new dependency is added or some code gen is necessary. Uh, so we're not re-implementing that. Uh, and it's not 100%, you know, no Bazel locally, of course. Uh, this also means that uh, shifting more of the compute to be done locally, which aligns with our experiments showing that the newest MacBooks provide best performance, actually. Uh, all of this results up to like 30 times faster incremental builds. And this is a big number because the numbers, the, 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 the numbers are small. So we are talking about like, you know, going from 30 seconds to a second. But for engineers, this is like really, really important. Um, the next one is generate build files. So to utilize Bazel's ability to parallelize, we keep build files at package level, but that increases the toil for the developers uh, to maintain these build files. We believe that auto-generating them is the right choice here. Uh, this is content very similar to Gazelle, uh, but we wrote our own because of additional features that we were, were missing at the time, uh, like uh, handling of cycles and caching. Um, we still use Gazelle for, for rendering. Um, the speed here is critical, so we have our own parser specific to the problem. Uh, we infer most of the dependencies from imports, uh, so to make it viable, we banned all wildcard imports, imports across repository. Uh, there's some exceptions for Scala. Um, we also have an IDE plugin that meets the developers where they are, uh, automatically updating the build files when imports are added, uh, provides a symbol search across the entire repository using RocksDB as a backend, and uh, gives suggestions for uh, missing uh, symbols. Uh, it's generally a really big lever for migrations. So it's useful during original, original migration to Bazel, future migration, any type of migrations, and it's also useful in stable state. Um, so can't give a monorepo talk without mentioning Java. Uh, the biggest thing here we have to share is that we use multiple source and runtime versions. We have 8, 17, and 21. Um, you can define them by setting the Java source version on our library macros or Java runtime version on our test targets. Uh, we also have convenience directives that will generate the attribute for your, uh, across your project. Um, for source, we use a, a single JDK that is the highest version, so in this case would be 21, and then use the release flag, uh, which acts as if setting source and target flags, but also compiles with correct version of the APIs uh, instead of the latest one, which is important. Uh, we default it to version 8, which is the lowest, and then overwrite uh, uh, specifying release multiple times because the last writer wins. Um, for test runtime, we include the Java binary in the, uh, and set the Java bin um, variable to point to it. Uh, and of course, we use univers universal binaries here. Um, I know some folks use a launcher attribute on uh, uh, Java test, which uh, is also valid, obviously, but requires maintaining some native code. Um, Given this mix, our IntelliJ plugin supports different languages per module. We support multi-module IntelliJ. Uh, but with all of this, we also have this uh, coloring, graph coloring problem on our hands. So um, you know, uh, here we have a deployable that's composed of targets compiling to different bytecode versions. And it's fine to run it on JVM 21, but it's not fine to run it on 17 because it has 17, uh, 21 bytecode in it. Um, so what we do is we mark all the deployable uh, artifacts with bytecode version that will use it 
that will be used at runtime, and then we have an aspect that checks the maximum bytecode that goes into the runtime class path, and it will fail at analysis time if this is violated. Uh, this is really important for us. Uh, uh, even in a steady state as we're not you know, like changing some version of, of, of Java, as data pipelines, the Spark data pipelines, uh, are holding a big chunk of the repository hostage on, on Java 8. Um, so then uh, there's Kotlin. Um, this is uh, the rule set we have the most uh, changes in our internal forks. I thought I'll quickly go over some of them here. Um, so uh, first one is Lombok. So when compiling a target with both Java and Kotlin sources, like the mix mode, uh, if the Java code doesn't use Lombok, it won't work out of the box. You have to ensure annotation processors run on Java code and remove the proc none from the, from the rules Kotlin. Uh, by default, the uh, Kotlin toolchain includes the standard lips that are imported directly by rules Kotlin. Uh, we'd like to be able to replace them with uh, our own Maven provided dependencies that match the language API version uh, we are actually using versus the compiler version itself. Uh, we have to bump the heap on the Kotlin builder. Um, we uh, have some fixes to JDEPS output, which we are we use for pruning uh, the compilation class path. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, uh, we exclude those uh, absolute paths. Uh, so uh, this is not per se super about uh, the build system itself, but it's a good example where a solution of the build problem maybe lies outside of it. So like I mentioned before, we use GraphQL, and we have a pretty standard uh, cogen where we convert GraphQL schemas to Kotlin, and then we compile it to bytecode. Uh, however, this got really big and started getting out of hand. Uh, we had well over 10 million generated lines of code, and the schema is pretty monolithic. So we were hitting limits of what we can do further to parallelize the build itself. And Kotlin compilation is uh, also much slower than, than Java. So we decided to do a direct to bytecode generation instead. Uh, I won't go into too much detail here. In short, we use Kotlin metadata and Java Sys, uh, Java Sys to generate it. Uh, but um, this gave us a 40% uh, reduction on critical path, which was awesome for our developers. So this like direct to bytecode generation is maybe something to consider. Obviously, it has its cons. Um, version resolution. Uh, so Bazel has one version policy, but our repo pre-migration was already in a multi-version state. Uh, Jack here talked at BaselCon 2022, so I'm just going to link you guys to here. You can find Jack, uh, you know, at uh, roaming around. Uh, one important update here is that now we do the resolution at analysis time, and uh, we manifest version overwrite logs in files. Um, so next we have test. Uh, we again don't use the built-in test runner because we have a mix of JUnit 4 and 5, and we wrote our own that predates some community efforts in this space. Uh, we added some uh, new features. We have individual unit tests and test class initialization timeouts. Our tests output how much resources they use, which help us sizing them. And we allow to run with async profiler to produce flame graphs. And uh, one interesting thing here is that most flame graphs will look something like this for our unit tests, where we'll see JVM calls mostly jitting, uh, taking a big chunk of the CPU. Uh, because of this, we, uh, we run our tests at package level instead of individual test classes as this overhead carries over. Um, and uh, also because of this, most uh, small tests actually scale linearly from one to two cores. So if you give it two cores, it runs in half time. So, so it's probably just uh, reasonable to run them like that. Um, collecting profiling data on tests is nice, as we had some big wins for very slow tests that were very easy to implement. Uh, it also democratizes and enables the developers to speed them up. Uh, so uh, even looking once at your test profiles is probably going to yield great results. So I just encourage you to do this also. Um, we also have everyone's flav favorite, flaky tests. Um, we, in general, we are super pleased with Bazel. Uh, migrating from, from Gradle to Bazel reduced our flaky test by around 5x. Um, our flaky test management uh, maintains and updates a uh, Bazel config file that is checked into the repository and holds a map from target to list of the disabled test IDs. Uh, we then pass this information to our test runner uh, and uh, in the macro. And um, I want to also stress that we actually disabled the tests and not just ignore them. Uh, we have several different ways of running these tests. On periodic runs, we want to be able to run all of them. That's also what we do locally as we want to expose the flakiness to the owners. Uh, however, on CI, we disable the flaky test completely. 
Uh, additionally, if a target has any flake tests, we add a flaky test attribute to it. Uh, in CI, developers can run on old branches uh, or outdated branches, so we additionally fetch the uh, latest disabled test and union the two sets. Uh, and the sad thing is Scala test does not cooperate with this model. Um, we are only able currently to disable entire test classes, not test methods. Uh, we have a working fix to the JUnit runner, but haven't incorporated it yet. Um, and this, this podcast is kind of like a Hail Mary. I, this is going to be like a bunch of flags that I didn't know where to put elsewhere. Um, so one neat, well, no, Lombok is not neat, but one neat Lombok config uh, 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 is to mark the generated code with Lombok generated, and then you can pass disable warnings in generated code to error prone, and it will allow error prone not to freak out with Lombok. Um, in general, we want to make things as hermetic as possible and completely avoid depending on the host system, which is uh, not always true by default. Uh, this avoids, avoids using the host JDK. Uh, this is useful for things like rules JVM external. Uh, we also make Corsair behave the same across platforms. There's this uh, watchFS uh, flag. Uh, this tells um, Bazel to use the operating system file watch service. Uh, we haven't seen huge gains from this, but it makes all local builds maybe one, two seconds faster, and it's not enabled by default. It hadn't hurt us, so I probably suggest also enabling it. Um, we hard link repository cache to save space. This is very important for us because each new third party library version is separate rules JVM external repo. Um, this cache is awesome, but we don't run it on persistent workers in CI because there's still no GC. We're, uh, very much looking forward to that being added. Um, we also use the downloader config that prevented a bunch of uh, uh, incidents that you, you probably saw publicly. Uh, um, we were able to avoid them. And the last one ensures that URL changes don't result in broken repositories due to caching. Um, and that's, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. I actually uh, had a lot more postcards, but realized 30 minutes is much less time than I thought it is. Uh, I hope you still learned a thing or two, and uh, we'll be build some uh, amazing uh, JVM repos together with Bazel. And if you have any questions, you can email me, find me, find me on LinkedIn. Um, I don't know if there's.